And so we, so there's Drosophila. And up here are uh, mosquitoes. They actually aren't on here. But there's a wide diversity of flies. And what we wanted to ask was, and so we actually are working on a bunch of these different flies, and this is just some nice pictures of the organisms we work on. We wanted to ask, when did this new gene that is specific to meiosis, when did that evolve? Did it evolve somewhere in here? Okay. We didn't really know about meiosis and its distribution. So we, we do this degenerate PCR business, and we pulled out lots and lots of uh, sequences. Um, and what we found, to our surprise, is so here are all those insects, all those dipteran flies, flies with two wings. And the specific version to meiosis is only present in Drosophila. OK? Um, so it's a really recent invention. So my student, Danielle, um, has been looking even more carefully and still only found in, in Drosophila among the genus Drosophila, lots of species of Drosophila. But you can see there's a whole bunch of diff different dipter, dipter and flies in here that don't have that. So it's a relatively recent invention uh, in, in, in fly evolution, including Muska housefly doesn't have it. So, this is a, so meiosis isn't set in stone. Right? Meiosis has changed. It's actually changed quite recently. Okay? And so we're trying to figure out even more narrowly sort of when that happened. Um, so, so that's just one little story. So in general, what we're doing is we're taking this natural history, this inventory, as it were, of all these different genes. Now this is getting really technical, but I'm going to try to generalize it. So each, each column here in yellow are genes that are specific to meiosis. The white columns are, are genes that we expect to be there anyway. So organisms like Giardia and Trichomonas, these are those organisms I talked about before, these are all organisms in boxes that weren't known to have a sex life. Right? I told you one of the reasons why I was interested in them because they weren't known to have sex. They, maybe they never learned how to do it. But look at this. They have this meiosis specific gene, all these, et cetera. So these are organisms that weren't known to have sex, but yet they've got the parts, as it were. Okay? And we found over and over organisms that weren't known to have sexual reproduction, this absence of evidence that we could find there, that they had a lot of these genes that we expected to only function in meiosis. Um, and we looked at this even more. So, that, so now I'm going to show you sort of an increasingly complex series of slides just to show you that um, some of these organisms like, like us and yeast and other fungi, it, it turns out there's a lot of these genes. This is now a survey of about uh, 29 genes. Um, it's not that single cells have uh, on a lot fewer genes than us. In fact, Trichomonas has 27 of the 29 genes in this survey. That, uh, that are involved in meiosis. So there's a series of genes that predates all eukaryotes. They're present among all eukaryotes. But these empty boxes here probably represent cases of genes that have been lost. So meiosis hasn't stayed exactly the same. It's been uh, evolving by uh, new genes, like in Drosophila, gene loss in some of these cases here. OK. So this is sort of um, coming to a point. Two things I want to tell you. Um, number one is, is what I just said, and, and a lot of stuff that I've talked about so far, suggests that meiosis evolved very early on at the base of eukaryotic evolution once. A wide diversity of eukaryotes has that set of machinery that defines meiosis, and that asexual organisms that we thought were asexual are actually sprinkled all along the tree, these number twos. They're all over the tree, which suggests that if so, they it wasn't that they never learned to have sex, it's just that they've they probably are capable of sex. Okay? They have the genes, or else they lost, them. they lost the ability to have sex very, very recently. Okay? Can we use this natural history? We, we know, who, for the most part, who has what genes. Can we use it as a way of going into an organism that we don't know, that we don't know is capable of sex to ask whether they're capable of sex? And what we really want to know is everybody doing it. This question, can meiosis be lost? And there's lots of asexuals that we can look at. And, and this gets to that deep question about the presence of sex. Is it actually a, necess a necessary uh, feature of being a eukaryote? All right, so this is a fun part. We have a putative asexual. Um, When I went looking for putative asexual, I mean, you know, I'm a biologist. I know about lots of different asexuals. But, I, but of course, I went to Google. And I said, put in asexual organism picture. You don't want to know all the things that showed up. But <laughs> one of the things that showed up was kind of surprising, and, and it stuck. I mean, it's, it's, uh, is that 
according to his creator, SpongeBob is asexual. I mean, it doesn't actually make sense that SpongeBob is asexual. Maybe SpongeBarb, okay? Because, you know, <laughs> boys can't really be asexual, okay? Um, but anyway, okay, so SpongeBob is asexual. Says his creator, says his creator. But we don't really believe that SpongeBob, we, we want to test, we wanna, we're scientists, we want to test whether SpongeBob or any other asexual organism that we're interested in. The traditional way would be we'd go out and look for SpongeBob populations. We'd go out and do population genetics. We'd go out and gather different individuals and we'd grind them with their DNA and we'd ask whether they're recombining. Okay, but you know that that's not what my lab's gonna do. We're gonna ask this question. We're gonna say, do they have the goods? Right? If they've got the goods, they're doing the deed, right? Um, if the meiosis genes are there, we might go back and do population genetics. That's hard work. You know, we're, you know, that, we have to go out and do collecting out in the field and stuff like that. And we're lab rats in my lab. Okay. Anyway, we're going to have these meiosis. Let's say SpongeBob has a bunch of these meiosis genes. We want to ask which ones? How many? Okay. Because if so, then we could start asking questions about their function. Are they expressed? Are they, are they turned on? Are they starting to make functional products, right? RNA. If, if they're expressed, we want to ask when and where. We know, as on that slide that I showed you, that there are certain steps in meiosis. We, you know, the, the DNA breaks ought to precede those proteins that are involved in the crossovers, for example. We know that the order of events ought to be more or less constrained. They ought to all be in the same place in SpongeBob. You know, if, if, if one gene is expressed here, and one gene is over here, and one gene is over here, then that's maybe not so good. But if they're all expressed, say, here, or maybe in his ear, because different organisms express their germlines in different parts of their bodies, in the same place, let's say. That might be good. A uh, little bit more complicated, because SpongeBob is not a genetics test system. It's not a Drosophila. We can't grow it in the lab very well. So we have to take a, have a way of assessing them, and we, and we can drop them into things like yeast cells as test tubes. If all these things look good, we might then be able to get a granny agency to say, you know, we really want to get SpongeBob to do sex. We really want to understand it, right? So can we induce it? I mean, if SpongeBob starts out as being an asexual, you know, the granny agency is going to say, why would, you, why would we give you money to induce sex? We know that SpongeBob doesn't have sex, but now we've got all this evidence. Can we induce meiosis? If so, he's not an asexual, and we, you know. <laughs> so, all right. So that's essentially... Uh, the global view of the kind of thing that we're interested in doing in my lab is sort of looking for organisms that are asexual and then asking these kinds of questions. Um, and these are our test subjects, at least initially. We've got some other ones. So these are the, these are the girls. These are deloid rotifers. These are female uh, lineage that have persisted for tens of millions of years. Some people say up to 100 million years, which is a really long time, maybe 40 million years. So there she is with her, her daughter, who is genetically identical to her. Okay. And it's a, you know, it's a group of organisms. They're microscopic. You can come up to the lab and look at them sometime. Um, and their closest relatives, which are called monogonot rotifers. And these rotifers are also capable of making clones of themselves. But they're also sexual. So they can actually you know, switch depending on conditions. And so we're going to compare what's known about these with these. And ask, what do we know about the meiosis genes here? And can we find the meiosis genes in these girls? Okay? Or are they all girls? Turns out that these have been pretty well studied. Uh, they're quite famous. There's no evidence for males. People, Leeuwenhoek, like uh, one of the famous people that, that developed microscopes, looked, talked about deloid rotifers and, and found no males. They're old. They don't have these homologous chromosome pairs that you would expect for sexual organisms, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of things that are consistent with them being asexual, but maybe not sufficient. So the genetic ev evidence is consistent with, but they're all based on these consequences. But what we really wanted to know, and, and, now, and now I'm a, sounding like a bro broken record, do they have the capacity for sex? Do they have the goods? Okay. Do they have the meiosis-specific genes? If so, our easy hypothesis is they're probably doing the deed. If not, it's a win-win situation. Then that's a really interesting case. And that's why Maynard Smith uh, promoted these as organisms to study. If we can study the exception, then that might tell us something about the rule. We have genes, genes that I've told you a little bit about. They're meiosis specific, they're conserved, et cetera. Okay? We go look for the genes. Degenerate PCR, I didn't get to really tell you about it. This is Andrew Shirko, my, my longtime postdoc. Easier said than done. True? Cindy's, Cindy, Cindy's nodding her head. Um, yeah. It looks easy, but it's actually not that easy. 
Um, but we've, luckily, we've had uh, data from the monogonon. So these are the sexual organisms. The meiosis-specific genes are in pink, and then the ones that, are, that everybody's expected to have are in black. The monogonons, the sexuals, we have a genome for these two things. They've got all the goods. All right. We've been doing degenerate PCR on some of these, and you see that it's spotty. It's hard to do, actually. Just because we didn't find it doesn't mean it's not there. But what's really interesting is that we found meiosis-specific genes among these red organisms. These are the deloids. These are not known to have sex. What the heck are they doing with those meiosis genes? Right? A little bit different way of looking at it. There are the genes. The, the meiosis genes are in yellow. The deloids are in blue. Meiosis specific genes, meiosis specific genes, et cetera. OK? So we have evidence for these genes that we think are only involved in meiosis in, a, in lots of other organisms. We don't know whether they're involved in, only involved in meiosis in these organisms, in these deloid rotifers. So what does it mean? Simplest explanation is. They're doing it on the side somehow. They're clandestine. All right? Uh, maybe they're there, but they're not turned on. Uh, one interesting thing and that happens in evolution is that, is that sometimes genes, and I talked about the origin of meiosis itself, genes gain new functions. All right? It's harder to explain for many, many genes. For one gene, it might be okay. Look back here. We've got a number of these genes that are doing different things. So that's a little bit harder explanation, but possible. Um, an interesting thing for the aficionados, meiosis is present, but it's used for automixis, which automixis is basically sex with oneself, right? So you make gametes and your, your own gametes fuse. Um, you get some benefits from, from meiosis that way, but uh, eventually um, those benefits go away. One possibility is that, is that they might be not rotifer genes. They're actually coming from, from some, some other organism that's either contaminating or that they've eaten or something like that. We, th we can pretty much rule that out with the kind of methods that we use. So anyway, we prefer this hypothesis, but we're not quite there to actually um, nail it down. Um, so stay tuned. All right, so I'm going to answer the questions. When did meiosis arise very early? How did it arise? By lots and lots of gene duplication. I didn't actually show you those data, but, uh, but it turns out that new genes don't come out of nowhere. Most of these meiosis genes evolved from other genes, from functions that have a role in fixing DNA. How has it evolved? There's lots of gene loss, those holes in those slides. Some new, some new genes and a little bit of more gene duplication. Okay? Don't know the answer to this question. If meiosis can indeed be lost, they would be really interesting organisms to look at. Okay? And this bigger question, um, you know, that's a career question, so ask me when I'm emeritus professor. Okay, thanks. <laughs>